missing something. Yeah. We are. Yeah. I'm not because you're my soft voice. And my, oh, you want one? Microphone. Microphone. Might want a mic up. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I was kind of didn't, well, I didn't expect you to be here this morning. So, glad you came back. Oh, what would my mother say to me? I was See, everything else is turned on ready to go. <laughs> Right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. You know, something else snuck up on me today. Mother's Day. Some of us um, will get to celebrate with our mothers today, and others will unfortunately not because our mothers have uh, gone on. Um, it's kind of sad. I, I look back at it and I can't believe it's been seven years since my mom passed. And I know for others of you it may be longer, maybe shorter. Um, unfortunately, there might be those of you out there that maybe didn't have a good relationship with your mom, didn't know your mom, uh, may have been given up for adoption. There's mothers out there that really, really, really want to be mothers, but they can't have kids. Or they've lost kids. Heaven forbid you've grown up and, and, and as a mother you've lost a child. Mothers go through a lot. <coughs> some are good, some aren't. But that's where we can take solace in our Heavenly Father, who uh, is always there for us no matter what. But for everyone that's out there, um, Happy Mother's Day and we just give God all the praise, honor, and glory for moms. Well, we've got a few announcements. Um, not as many as last week, amazingly. We don't have a movie to promote yet, yet, I say, because July will bring another movie. So keep it in, tune in for that. We'll have that out soon enough. But this Wednesday, we continue with week two of the Truth Project groups. I almost said sermon series, because today we kick off week one of the actual sermon series. So um, Pastor Mark will be speaking on veritology or what is truth this morning. But on Wednesday, we pick up with number two, which is philosophy and ethics with a question. It says who? And it's described this way. It says truth is not simply an academic concept. The way we think about truth has a direct bearing upon the way we live our lives. What's more, our understanding of right and wrong is directly dependent on our worldview. Is the universe God's creation or a closed cosmic cube? I just can't see it as a closed cosmic <coughs> cube. I can't see it. And, and I don't know about y'all, but when I was a kid, I used to lay on the grass because I grew up in the country. I'd lay on the grass, I'd look up at the clouds, or at night, I'd look up into the stars. And my mind would just feel like it was going to blow up because I had been told that it was endless. You know, in here I can see the other wall. I know there's an end to the room, either that way or that way. Or, but when you look up into space, it, and it goes on forever and ever, and that's how great our God is. Then, very quickly following that, this coming Saturday, we have... Uh, our May races for our 17th, 17th season of Orange Track Racing. So we're looking forward to that. In June, um, is the I think it's the 11th. 11th. It's the second Saturday in June. Same day as our next race, um, the folks over at uh, the family room over here uh, are going to be putting on like an open house for themselves because they just moved in over there. But they have invited us to, because they knew it was racing weekend, they invited us to be a portion part of that. And she's got, she's asked, what what do you want me to tell people? And so we're going to giving her some stuff, and, and she's going to uh, direct people over this way, which is really kind of cool um, that we can share this space and and promote one. And you know, um, she's they came last month with their with their tribe and. Uh, I say try because they had six of their kids with them. It's a blended family. It's a Brady Bunch family. Which there's nothing wrong with that. I have a Brady Bunch family. It's just not as big as theirs. Um, they have a whole baseball team. 
but we look forward to doing that and, and having so many people with exposure to Orange Track. And also, because, you know, those of you who heard last night, you know, this was a theater for a little while. We are all working this way, but this room is just, gives us so many opportunities to do so many things, but it's God's house. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for a day that we can celebrate our mothers. Father, we thank you for those mothers who were there for us. And Father, we pray for those mothers who haven't been able to find a way to be there for their kids, for whatever their reasons are. Father, we pray that those relationships could be healed, that the, side, they, the two parties could come together, the, the children and the mother, and get to know each other and have a relationship. But Father, we do know that regardless of those relationships, that we can have a relationship with you, and we thank you for that. Father, as we prepare to uh, go into our call to worship this morning, and then to hear the, the words that you've given to Pastor Mark about what truth is, that you would open our minds to maybe something new to us. You would open our ears to hear that, and you know, open our hearts to accept it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And this comes from the New King James Version. Hear what is written. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. That just reads differently than what you're used to. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we can know the way. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, when Mark first sent this to me, the first thing I did is I went into my, my uh, library of songs in my head and I pulled up Audio Adrenaline and started singing Big House. <laughs> because that's just the way my brain works. But when we think about this passage, think about the comfort that we find in having a home. Now, we're all in different states of, of where we live here. Right? Yeah. And our homes vary greatly. But our heavenly home, He's prepared a place for us, a mansion for us in heaven. And He also tells us in this passage this is really weird because I had a dream last night about driving. It, it talks about the road narrow and the gate small that leads to life. But think about this. I, I, my dream last night, I'm driving down the road, and for whatever reason, I'm crossing the Mississippi. And I'm coming from Illinois into Iowa. And you, if you've ever driven that, you know how far down the river actually is. But in my dream, the bridge was going up and down. Oh. And the water was washing over it. And you know how some people are, I was like, I can make it. So I start that path down that road and I get in and I get hit with that first wave under the windshield. And I immediately talk to Diane, my wife, and, and for whatever reason, she's not in the passenger seat, probably because she's smarter than I am. <laughs> but she, it's almost like she's spiritually with me. And she's telling, and she's guiding me as if, as if God is talking through her to me, telling me I, should, I can't make it. I can't make it on my own. And so I, I back up. And then the, the dream instantly ends. 
we have to fully rely on God. And Christ has prepared a place in heaven for us. And the Spirit, he, we're redeemed. That's the, that's the beauty of it. Regardless of what we're going through, we're redeemed. And there's so much in today's world where they talk about there's more than one way to heaven. Jesus, in, in the last part of this passage that, that Mark had chosen, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one path to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. Father, as we prepare to hear what truth is from Pastor Mark this morning, Father, again, we pray for open hearts, for open minds and open ears. Father, we pray that the words that we would hear would teach and that they would teach not just as words like as if we were reading things off the page but that they would sink into us that they would borrowing on the name of the movie last night that they would break through to us father and that when we leave this place that we would have that much more that we can show why the hope that we have in you matters so much and what it means to Father, I pray a blessing on Pastor Mark and the words that you've given him this morning. Thank you for his commitment to you, to this ministry, to his family. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Jerry. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Whether you're here in person or online, uh, we welcome you here this morning. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. You know, the, the thing about it is, is I always like to start with that now. It, it kind of, you know, juices me up for the for the sermon and the message that we need to hear. And, and uh, you know, there's nothing more important than the message of truth. Because, see, truth is the basis for our faith. And if we have that good basis of truth, then we can have a good basis, a good foundation for our faith. So that is why I, I chose that uh, call to worship that we had this morning. And uh, so I, I want to kind of let that sink in for a few minutes for you guys and, and think about what that was, what that call to worship was. And Pastor Terry hit on a couple of the points that I wanted to hit on. And so that is awesome. means we're, we're hitting on all cylinders here. We're communicating telepathically. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> so happy Mother's Day. Uh, mothers, this is our opportunity to celebrate all the mothers that were out there. And let's face it, we need to celebrate them because it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. So thank you, Mom. Okay. And uh, so I was, I was laying awake at about 4 o'clock this morning. And, and uh, so I was saying some prayers and things. And, and I was thanking God that... My mom has passed away, and, and so she's up, and I, I thought about it, and uh, I was thinking, boy, I bet you she's teaching my twin sister how to play piano in heaven. And uh, that's just, wow, that's powerful. So uh, I know that she's up there uh, with my brother and my sister. It's a good place for so today I kind of wanted to start out and celebrate mothers, and I wanted to talk about a mother's love. And so I've got a poem about mother's love. There are times when only a mother's love can understand our tears, can soothe our disappointments, and calm all our fears. There are times when only a mother's love can feel the joy we feel, when something we've dreamed about quite suddenly is real. There are times when only a mother's faith can help us on life's way and inspire us in confidence we need from day to day. For a mother's heart and a mother's faith and a mother's steadfast love were fashioned by the angels and sent from God above. So if you think about that and you think about how much joy a mother can bring in, yeah, boy, I was, I have to admit, it wasn't always the easiest time for my mom raising me and my brother and all the, 
there was an old joke that my mom had to be one of the strongest people around because she was constantly raising dumbbells. And, uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I think about that from time to time. Not that we were really dumb, but you know, <laughs> maybe we didn't catch on to behaving properly <clears throat> all the time. So the things that a mom puts up with, and then when we looked at the movie last night, we saw that mother's love and that mother's faith. And the neat thing about this, I, I put this poem down days ago. But when we looked at the movie, that breakthrough that we saw last night, and we see that mother's love, that unending love, that faith that God will make it right and he will heal. That mother's love that brought him back to that point. God heard her call. It was because of that faith and that mother's steadfast love that was sent from the angels and sent from God above. And I thought that was really special this morning, so I wanted to share that with you before I went into the message. So that we need today to celebrate mothers. You know, we had, some people had really good mothers and some had some not so good mothers. And But the thing about it is, is that still in all, they helped us grow one way or another. And we need to celebrate that today. So thank you, moms. So today we're going to start on Veritology. And, and uh, if you were here on Wednesday night uh, when I was teaching you, Veritology is not really a real word. So when Dr. Del Tackett was, was uh, <laughs> creating the Truth Project, he says, I need, I need a word that really speaks about what we're doing here. And so he went to the Greek, and veritas in Greek is the word truth. And ology is the study of. So if you have psychology or anything, it's a study of the psyche, the human psyche. Uh, so veritology, he says, is the study of the truth. And why is this important? Why is truth important? Because, see, without that basis of truth, like I said before, you have nothing to build your faith upon. <clears throat> you can't build faith upon a lie. Because lies aren't truth. Lies are based on deceit. Truth is based on the facts. Well, in 1828, Webster, Noah Webster, uh, define the truth as conformity to reality. And as a worldview goes, I think it's a pretty accurate description of what truth is. Conforming to a reality. And if you listen in today's worldview, you know, they say, well, there's all kinds of different realities and, and uh, you know, virtual realities and everything else. But uh, you can easily be led astray by whatever the reality of the day seems to be and that worldview that pushes that reality forward. Some people call it an agenda. But a reality is very, very much subject to the receiver, to the person, to the individual who is viewing that reality. So R.C. Sproul is a theologian and his definition of a biblical worldview on truth shed a different take on that truth and he says that truth is defined as that which corresponds to a reality as perceived by God. Wow, that's a complete different spin from that worldview definition that Noah Webster put up. Truth is defined as that which corresponds to a reality as perceived by God. In other words, truth is reality as God sees it. Truth is reality as God sees it. Now that puts a whole different take on it. That gives us a whole different foundation on which to build. And as much as we perceive reality in the way that God sees it, if we do it that way, then we perceive reality correctly. And see, that then is the truth. So as we progress through the study, uh, this Truth Project study is a 12-session study. And we go through a lot of different things and a whole basis for who we are, who God is, what truth is, what our faith is all about. And so as we go through this sermon series in here, 
we want to help you build that foundation and build upon what, uh, what God has given us to give to each other. And I'd like to say it's, it's kind of a fresh start on opening your mind to new possibilities. And so we kind of have to put aside what we've been taught and what the world has pushed upon us for all our lives. And for some of us, you know, 60 plus years of hearing these kind of things, we have to kind of take that fresh start. We need a fresh start to go forward. Others are lucky they're hearing it at a much earlier age. But we need to look to learn and look at the world differently from what you may have been taught before. And that is what's called the world view. What we have kind of assimilated into our lives based upon those things, those agendas, and those perceptions of reality that we have been either taught or that we have been assumed because of the agendas of the day. And I think you understand what I mean by that. Flip on the news channel, watch for three minutes, and you're going to see someone's agenda is kind of getting pushed on everyone else. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to take a very comprehensive look at what this worldview is. And the, the worldview compass is designed then in this project to point us to God's design in all areas of life. And so we start at the top with truth and we kind of go all the way around social order, man, God, who we are, who we were meant to be in God's eyes in that reality that I was talking about earlier. And so we talk about all these different things, science, philosophy, ethics, church, God and man, community, family, state, law, arts and media, labor, history. It's very, very comprehensive look, a biblical worldview based on the perception of God and that truth, which should be the foundation of who we are in our faith. So when we look at it, it's a very systematic view. It means we have a very specific order that we follow, and it's a, it's a system to help develop that biblical worldview. And it's systematic, and so what they've done is uh, they have created a temple structure, and that temple structure um, looks like this. And so we need to have a good foundation of what's going on to build our beliefs and our faith. And if you look at on here, it's kind of hard to see. Maybe on that one it'll be bigger. Um, but who we are. So every one of those topics that are in that compass are built on either the columns or the structure or the overhead or the overarching view. And it's done very systematically. And the temple structure explains the foundations and frameworks of the course topics. In order to build our understanding, we need a foundation and a framework to reference and that is the basis of faith. That is the way that the Bible is actually structured. It starts at the beginning, gives us a foundation level of who we are, how we were created, God created the world, who God was, who God's people are. And it takes us through the first five books in the Bible, and that's called the Pentateuch. And the first five books in the Bible, then, are those foundational things that we need to figure out what this is all about, to start down that path, to find out why we're here, what is our purpose in life. And so it's kind of fun to take a look at these kind of things uh, from that framework perspective to give us a good foundation of faith, but more so a good foundation of who we are, why we are, and where we are in God's plan. So the purpose is the tour is to, as Del Tackett puts it, to, to gaze upon the face of God. Wouldn't that be something? To gaze upon the face of God? See, the goal is not to just understand the information, but to ultimately turn and gaze upon the face of God. We cannot gaze upon the face of God and not be unchanged. We cannot do that. If we think about it in the Bible and we think about Moses when he was up on the mountain, uh, Moses stood in the presence of God, but could not gaze upon him. And he was on the mountain, and he received the Ten Commandments. He was physically changed just by being in God's presence. 
he was physically changed. He came down, his hair was white. And he was physically changed. He was a different person just from standing in the presence of God. But he couldn't gaze upon him because he was too brilliant. It was too much for him to see. So he was physically and spiritually changed just being in the presence of God. So we are here to gaze upon the face of God in this study. In other words, we're wanting to see things from God's perspective so that we know the truth. That we know the truth. So one of the first questions we had in the study is, why was Jesus born? Why did he come into the world? And it was kind of fun because we got to hear several different answers. And I love what he did. Oh, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. No. That's a great answer. No. That's a great answer. No. And they are all good answers. And in that person's perspective, they were all true. That was their truth. That was their reality of why Jesus came into the world and why Jesus was born. So why did Jesus come into the world? In other words, why did the God of the universe come into a corrupt world to die for our sins? Knocking on the door. Oh, it's the sign. <laughs> the sign's banging on the walls. There's nobody there. <laughs> Come on in. Wow. Woo, exactly. I was going, hey, the Holy Spirit's with us today, and he's knocking on the door. Can I get an amen? Woo. I must be saying something right here. That's right. Why did. <laughs> Why did the God of the universe come into a corrupt world to die for our sins? I mean, we got to think about that. Because really, truly, that is the basis of our faith. See, if Jesus didn't die, then the rest of it makes no difference whatsoever. Right. Mm -hmm. But see, Jesus did come. He did die. He took on our sins. <clears throat> in the midst of a corrupt world. In the midst of the people who... He wanted to say that were the people who rebelled against him, who rebelled against God, not just once, not just twice, but again and again and again and again. You know, the question was asked of Jesus, how many times do we forgive? Seven times, which was the Jewish custom and law at the time. And he says, no, 70 times seven. What he was meaning is you never stop forgiving someone. You never stop. Jesus answered the questions before the civic ruler of his day, Pontius Pilate. And we find this in John 18, 37. It says, Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. See, Jesus came to show us the truth, a real, live, living truth. See, they had the truth in the scrolls. They'd been carrying the scrolls in the Ark of the Covenant. And the priest, the chief priests of the day would read those scrolls. And they would read some of the scrolls but maybe not all of the scrolls because the people were then getting that chief priest perception of what he wanted those people to hear that was one of the problems see and it didn't just happen once but it had been happening for hundreds of years so jesus came into the world to be the living truth forget about the scrolls here I am in your presence. God said, we, these guys are not getting it. I was talking about my mom raising dumbbells. She probably at some point in time said, these guys are just not getting it. Me? Hey. You know, it's a tough thing to do when you're a kid, especially for boys, I think. <laughs> but the truth is that Jesus came into the world to save us, to die for our sins. That is the basis. That is the truth of our faith. The problem is, in our world that we live in, our world is full of lies, so we always have to stand vigilant so that we can recognize the truth. 
we have to stay vigilant because the lies are going to come sneaking in from every which direction and they're going to try and undermine that truth isaiah recognized it in the day that that he was writing and, and in 59 14 isaiah writes that uh, that justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot answer wow does that sound familiar that's not anything whatsoever like our world today. Justice, the truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Wow. So if it was true in those days and it's true in these days here, it doesn't look like anybody learned the lesson in the meantime, or a lot of people have it. Just as it was in ancient Israel, also the lies continue to confuse us and keep us from the truth that Jesus presents. In today's vernacular, we call this fake news, right? Mm -hmm. Fake news. You haven't heard about that any time lately, have you? <laughs> so in today's world, we have the information superhighway, the internet, right? So we have a lot more information at our fingertips, literally, mm -hmm. than what they had back in those days. And the internet is the pathway to the truth, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you can believe everything that's written on the internet. I mean, it's got to be real, right? So they did an audit study a couple of years ago on Wikipedia. Anybody know what Wikipedia is? Mm -hmm. So if you go out and type something in there, you're going to see something pop up from Wikipedia. 55% of what they found written in Wikipedia was false or not completely true. Wow. Wow. 55%. So I just kind of warn you, you know, if you're going on Wikipedia, don't take that as the God's honest truth. Because it probably isn't. You got less than half the time it's going to be true. Wow. That's huge. Sometimes the lines between truth and lies become blurred, and fact and half truths are intermixed so much. It's difficult to know one from another. We need to be able to see the truth and tell it from the lies. One of the gifts of the Spirit, if we come into that presence of God and we, we come into that full relationship with God, through the Holy Spirit, we are given a, a gift of discernment. That means you are given a gift to know just by hearing what's real and what's false. That gift of discernment. And this is why we need this. And see, we as Christians, we need to testify to the truth. We need to be able to tell others about the truth. And if we don't know what the truth is, and we can't tell the truth from lies, we can't testify to other people. John 18, 37 says, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. So twice in my life, I've been called to testify before a grand jury, to testify against some very, very bad people. And they were both RICO trials. Does anybody know what a RICO trial is? Yeah, they're not fun. A RICO trial is one is against organized crime. Very bad people. <laughs> so I got escorted, picked up, escorted by the FBI and two federal marshals to go to the courthouse to my hotel room, go back to the courthouse. This went on for three days in the first trial. They didn't want anybody to be able to get at me or know where I'm at. I couldn't tell anybody where I was going, when I'd be back, nothing. And there's a real good reason for it. They didn't want me to die. And that's a, that's a really tough truth. That even though I was on the good side <laughs> and going through this trial, I faced a verbal assault of questions in that jury trial and see they wanted to know if I was telling the truth and so they asked me the same question from several different angles and they kind of spin it a little bit different and hit me and it was when I say a barrage you have 12 people lined up across the room you're sitting here by yourself no no attorney at your side nobody to advise you on anything you're there by yourself and you talk about sweat 
I don't care what kind of deal you ever use. It didn't work. It didn't work. And I was on the good side, and I'm going, I didn't do anything wrong, but boy, I got to tell you, it was a barrage of questions. It was, an, uh, it was absolutely a mental assault on me. They wanted to break everything down so they knew what the truth was. Because that truth then, beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt, was going to be the basis by which that trial proceeded. <clears throat> so think about not doing that once, but twice. Now the second time I was a little bit more prepared and, uh, well, I knew what I was going to face, <laughs> but you're never prepared. Uh, but they needed to be certain of what the God's honest truth was because of what was at stake. Because of what was at stake. And every time that I went there, I placed my hand on the Bible and swore to tell the truth, so help me God. See, even the courts know how important that covenant is with God. They know how important that is. Jesus came to testify to God's sovereign power, to his love, to his grace, to his mercy, to show beyond a reasonable shadow of the doubt who he was, who he said he was, because lives were at stake. All our lives, all of us, were at stake. So Jesus came to show us a living truth beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond reasonable doubt. That's all you have to have is you have to show evidence beyond reasonable doubt in order to convict a certain person of a crime. Jesus took it to the cross, gave his very life for that truth, gave his very life for our sin. Gave his very life to show God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy. See, God's grace poured out on us from the cross. Jesus took on our sins for all eternity. God showed his love because he gave his one and only son to die on that cross for us. The same people who rebelled against him. And he showed us his mercy because... We were the ones that deserved to be on the cross. We are dead because of our sins, but through Christ, he has saved us. And that's what I want to talk about, is that scriptural emphasis on the truth, that sanctification and salvation, that connection to the truth, that living truth that Christ was, saved us from our death on the cross. That's mercy. God's grace poured out on us that even though we were sinners, he sent his son to die for us so that we could have eternal life through him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That is the truth. He came to testify. He gave his life for that truth. We need to understand that we need to take that to heart. We need to let that into our holy of holies, our hearts, and hold on to it. That is the basis of our faith. That is the basis of who we are, why we're here, why God brought us into the world to begin with, why he created us. And we need to do that. We need to worship God for that. We need to thank him each and every day. We need to give him our testimony of faith. Say, so see what I've done for you. Who am I to say no? Who am I to say no? Look what God has done for us. So, with our sanctification, our salvation, that connection to the truth, if you can't recognize the truth, how are you going to know what's real? A few weeks ago, I gave a message on sanctifying grace. Grace that will save us from death because of our sinful nature. See, man's sinful nature will suppress, distort, reject, and exchange God's truth for lies. That's how we separate ourselves from God. That's, that's how we get led astray. Satan's great at it. He'll come from us from any form whatsoever that happens to be out there. 
it's inherent in our fallen human nature to question the truth. And this cosmic battle that goes on between truth and lies started in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. The serpent told the first lie on earth against God truth to Eve when he said, You will surely not die. Genesis 3, 4. Instead of listening to the truth, Eve believed that lie. She thought she could eat from the tree and still live. Well, in a way, she was correct. Physically, she did not die. But Eve was wrong. Eve was wrong. She believed the lie, but she died spiritually. See, that, that spiritual relationship between God and man was severed at that point in time. That perfect relationship that God gave her was broken. Her perfect world, the Garden of Eden, everything was laid out. Anything they, they needed or wanted was in that garden. Theirs for the taking because God created them to be in that garden and gave them a perfect life. But she, she went through it. She, she believed that lie. And that broke that relationship from God. And I think we know the rest of the story, right? Her whole world was shattered. And she would, she would pay the price for that disobedience. And see, we've been following her lead and believing it lies ever since. In our fallen state, we don't respond well to the truth. Paul even came through and warned about people who would eventually turn away from the truth and turn aside to, to myths and false teachers. 2 Timothy 4 3 and 4 says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to the sound of wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Hey, they will reju reject the truth and chase after myths. Fake news? <laughs> he was telling us, fake news is on the way. Get ready. But see, they had this problem then. We still have this problem now. But we have a much easier and much fuller access to the lies because of where we are in our technology today. This happens with unbelievers, but it also happens to believers before they accept Christ in their lives or before they're converted. There are other responses we have concerning the truth that and in Romans 1.18 it says, We suppress the truth, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Furthermore, we, we distort the truth. Acts 20.30 says, Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Kind of want you to think about today's society i think about what you experience in your life each and every day and as i go through these four points i want you to think about is this happening in my world today is this happening in my life today we reject the truth romans 2 8 but he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness we exchange the truth for a lie. Romans 1.25 says, They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshipped and served the things that God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. We create idols in our lives based upon our perception of our reality. And we, we worship these idols. What I'm saying by that, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're going to fall down before them on your hands and knees and pray to them. But see, what it means is we create these idols in our lives, these things that replace God in our lives, and we worship them by giving them our time, by giving them our efforts. If we turn around and give them more time than what we're giving God, who created us, who died for us, and if we're giving those kind of things, we have created an idol that has replaced God in our lives. And see, that's the cosmic battle. The spirit of truth versus the spirit of falsehood. Reality versus illusion. 
Jesus tells us, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. The Apostle John echoes this definitive claim to the truth by aligning his teachings with Christ when he said, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of error. 1 John 4, 6. And see, if we think about it, these are really radical claims in Scripture. Jesus and the apostles are on the side of the truth, and those who disagree are on the side of falsehood. And he's trying to point out to the people, you need to be aware, you need to be vigilant, because there's people out there spreading lies all the time. You need to know what the truth is. Don't get led astray. These verses were set up on two sides of the battle between truth and and error. So imagine this, we have a scene from between God and Satan. We'll take you to the book of Job 1 and 2. And the first lie comes out. Did God really say you will surely die if you eat of the fruit of the tree? Genesis 3, where it all began. Well, God knew the truth. So he applied that to Job. Work once, why not twice? God knew the truth. Job was a good man before the Lord. He knew the nature of Job's faith. He knew Job would not succumb to evil. See, God knew that Satan was doomed to fail from the start. Because Job had that faith, he understood and he lived it out daily. He lived out the truth of his faith in his heart daily. And so God goes, fire away Satan. Good luck. He knew that Satan was failed from the start. Because Job was a good man in his heart. His faith was pure. And the truth was real in his life. There's a sync, uh, link between salvation and the truth in 2 Thessalonians. God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and the belief in the truth. So this battle that's going on between Satan and the lies of the world and God embracing the truth, he's saying, people, please understand, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and belief in the truth. He's trying to point the people back, saying, remember this. This will get you through all of the lies that are coming your direction. Remember that truth. John 8, 44 says, you have two fathers. You belong to your father, the devil. Ooh, what a statement. How would you like somebody saying that to you? But see, until we surrender to the will of God, we will be subject to the will of Satan. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. In the world today, God is being pushed aside by many because they feel God expects too much for them. He wants us to give up too much. I want you to ask yourselves right now, how much has God given up for you? And then see if he's asking too much of us. It's much easier to go with the flow like lemmings off the cliff. Everybody know what a lemming is? The little furry animals are out there. They follow each other in packs. They don't really know where they're headed. But by the thousands every year, they make a migration. And these lemmings dive off a cliff down onto the rocks and into the water to be smashed and drowned. But they just follow each other. Lemmings. See? It's easier to go with the flow like lemmings off the cliff, but that leads you to certain death. <coughs> they don't get the point at all. God gave it all in his son Jesus. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe him. We owe him our worship. We owe him our lives. Literally, we owe him both. We have a connection between sin, lies, and deceit. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Right through. They've been every sin that we have that embraces us or tries to pull us away from God can be traced to a lie. Our sins take us captive to the lies of the world. And how many times have other people tried to argue against you, against your faith? And say, oh, come on, you don't believe that stuff, do you? Do you? Were you one of the ones who argued against someone else's faith? Never? Ouch. That nagging little voice in your head that is filling you up with doubt and questioning. See, that's the voice of Satan. That's the voice of those lies trying to come against God. Shut those heaters off. It's getting really dry in here. That nagging little voice in your head. You know, I had a sermon here a year ago where I had the little devil on one arm and on shoulder and the angel up here on another shoulder. But really, truly, that's exactly the way it is. It's the angel is telling you the truth of God. This is what you need to do in your life. And it's, yeah, you don't need to do that right now. Let's, uh, let's procrastinate a little bit. Let's push this off to the side for a little while. You know, we'll, we'll, you'll get to it eventually. So that's that cosmic battle that's going on. Sometimes it takes place between the ears. We're battling ourselves. We need to recognize that. We have to understand that nagging little voice in your head that's filling you out with doubt and questioning that you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You can't do that. You know, God's not going to help you out here. You're on your own. We believe that little voice that Satan telling us and what happens. We end up in the bottom of the pit just exactly where he wants us. And we fill our head full of deceit. We fill our head full of sin. We fill our head, head full of lies and deceit. And we become depressed. Because when we do that, it darkens our spirit. And when it darkens our spirit, we can't see the light. We can't see the truth from all of the lies. That's exactly what Satan wants. So we have to be able to discern what is lies, what is truth, what is separating us from God. And we need to get rid of that. We need to get it out of our lives. Quit dragging that baggage with you. Leave it at the cross. Let God deal with it. He says, I'm here to take those burdens away from you. My yoke is light. He wants us to leave those burdens at the cross. Jesus died to take those burdens away from us. What are we carrying around for? Why? They're dragging your life down. They're keeping you from the fulfilled life that God wants you to have. Point number five is we have to deal with outsiders. Second Timothy 2 and Colossians say, <laughs> They have been taken captive, and we must gently instruct them. Let our speech be seasoned with salt. Those who don't know Jesus don't know the truth. And therefore, we can't revile them for the fact that we must shepherd them to bring them into the fold. And I use that term because it was in the movie last night. He was talking about that sometimes they're astray. They're broken down. They're hurt. They can't make it back on their own. So the shepherd goes and picks up that wounded sheep, puts it across his shoulders, and carries it back to the fold so it can heal. And those people who are broken down in our world, in our community, our friends, our family that are broken down, we got to put them on our shoulders. we got to carry them back to the fold. We have to carry them to the foot of the cross because Christ can heal them. God can heal them. God can bring them back in. That's what miracles are all about. And see, when we do that, it allows God to do that work within us. It allows us to see the miracles that God has for us in our lives and in their lives. It allows him to do his work. But we have to do our part. That's what I was talking about in that message three weeks ago. Is we have to do our part. God can't do it all. We have to say yes. We have to accept that. And then God can do his part. 
So it all comes down to a battle of worldviews, the opposition between God's truth claims and the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So, got an hour on this one. Where do I start? Well, let's take a look at that. So, God's truth claims in the lives of the world, of the flesh and of the devil. Turn on the news. Go to social media. Pick your pick. Doesn't matter. They're all the same. The immoral minority has taken more and done more to destroy Christianity than anyone or anything in the past. The immoral minority that's out there. Advancing, advancing anti-Christian agenda, they have attacked every aspect of our moral society and won. God has been removed from our society, from our schools in many ways. You name it, you look at it, that minority has had their voices heard louder than the loud than the voices of God's people. And so this minority has been allowed to win and take control. They want God out of everything, period, and a sentence. They want God out of everything. And it's a sad state of society when the fringes control the narrative. It really is. So what is the truth? What is the truth as it relates to reality? See, the reality of our world right now is the fringes are con controlling everything. I'll take you back to that Webster's 1828 definition. The reason you use the 1828 definition is because if you take that and compare that version of Noah Webster's dictionary, it was undaunted by political correctness. The definitions that exist in today's dictionary are completely filled with all of those agendas. We, we have to be politically correct. Well, this is what it is. Go back to there. How far back did we have to go? That's sad. We shouldn't have to do that. So Noah says conformity to fact or reality is the difference. And if you listen in today's society, people feel that they have different realities. But really, it's the same reality coming in from different perspectives. We have made different choices that may have, have us on different paths, but see, we all are in the same reality. And so I came up with this. So we have this number down here, okay? What number is it? What do you think it is? From my point, it's a six. Six. What do you think it is? A nine. Nine, okay? So our reality, our perception of what reality is, comes by what our perception is, what our viewpoint at that point in time is. It all depends upon what your point of view is. That's what becomes your reality. But what is it really? What is the truth? Which is the fact? That's why we need to be able to discern what's coming at us. Because some people are going to tell us that's a six. Other people are going to tell us it's a nine. We need to be able to figure out what the truth is. What the basis of the fact is. So... I want you to think about that and kind of store that one back away. When I talk about perceptions and reality, this is what it's about. Point number two is equating an idol to a lie. Lies are powerful and lead us to insane notions. The example in our lesson that we had the other day was very powerful. Isaiah 44, 15 says that this guy went into the woods and he chopped down this tree. And he brought the tree back and he cut it in half. And then he split up the wood and he made a fire and he cooked it and with it he warms himself and bakes his bread. Then yes, it's true. He takes that other half and he makes himself a god to worship. He makes an idol made out of wood and he bows down to it and he worships it. So I ask you, from where does this piece of wood draw its power? Okay, how can this hunk of wood change the world? 
How can that hunk of world wood save people? How can it bring them hope? Well, I guess you could burn it in hopes to stay warm. But the rest is insanity at best. When we think about the things that will separate us from God, the lies, the deceit, those kind of things. Well, if you just whittle this down, oh, hey, that's kind of neat. This is now my God, and I'm going to worship him. Doesn't make a lot of sense to a sane person. We all see it as insanity because we know better. Why do we know better? Well, because someone has told us the truth. Ooh, kind of cool how that works, huh? That's called discernment. So what is insanity? See, we all, we all suffer from common insanity. Losing touch with reality. We're going back to that definition of Noah Webster's. Einstein said that doing the same thing over and over and over again, repeatedly, and expecting different outcome is the definition of insanity. And I look at people's lives today, and I look at what they're doing, and they're doing the same things over and over and over again, but yet they want a different reality. They want a different outcome. Guess what? Ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. If you're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting something different, you're nuts. It's not going to happen. At some point in time, reality needs to step in and say, the truth of what's going on here is, it's never going to happen if I do these things. I need to look for a different reality. I need to change my perspective so that I can see the truth for what it really is. And that's what we're talking about today. That's what this whole message is about. That's what Veritatum is. Being able to see that the perspective you've been looking through is wrong and bringing you back into God's truth is reality. We need to break that cycle and see that there's a better way to life. To see that truth can unlock the insanity. It can unlock that cycle. So I ask you today, what is your reality? What is your reality? Well, our actions reflect what we be, believe to be really real. Our actions reflect what we believe to be really real. Jesus' example in Matthew 6 is saying, Why do you worry? Will he not care for you? Oh, you of little faith. So in our class Wednesday, the video showed a boy standing on the end of a diving board, torn by fear and doubt. Because he knew if he jumped in that water, he could surely drown. But his mother was in the water. Someone in whom he had trust. He had faith. On this Mother's Day, I think it's a great example. Mom was sitting there treading water in the deep end, waiting for him to make his decision. Was he going to jump? Or was he not going to jump? Was he going to believe that doubt, that, that thing that's going on between his ears and here, the deceit? The lies, or was he going to have faith in his mother, take a leap of faith off of that diving board? Well, he did just that. He dove into the deep end with his mother there, and guess what? He was fine. But I loved it because the look on his face wasn't just, you know, relief that he didn't drown. It was pure enjoyment. This is great. I bet you he hopped right up there and just boom, 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 time and time again off that board because he understood he was embraced in that truth, in that reality. He had faith that he was not going to drown. And that unlocked that cycle of insanity, of fear and doubt and deceit and lies and allowed him to see a different reality. The reality of truth and trust and faith and it works see that little illustration spoke really loudly to me do you have the faith it takes to make that leap of faith to take that next step sure it might be going off the deep end but guess what God's got you he's already there he knows your future because he wrote the plan for your future. 
He broke the plan for your life. He's not going to send you to certain death because he didn't preach for that. Just like in the movie last night, we saw that that little boy, he kept getting told, you've got a bigger future. You've got something planned for you. God's got something planned for you. And he did. And he did. That boy has got a story to tell from the pulpit. He went into ministry. God had a plan for his life. If he didn't die, he wouldn't have such a story to tell. But through that, he could reveal the miracles of God, the truth over the lies, the truth over the deceit. He was a living testimony to the truth of God. Jesus was a living testimony to the truth of God. How do we live out our lives? What is your reality? Connecting our faith with our actions and emotion. God is the object of our faith and of our hope. Our actions are the most reliable indicator of our beliefs. What we do is totally controlled by our beliefs. I've said it before and, and in other messages. We believe what we perceive. Our beliefs drive our actions and our actions define our character, who we are. Who we are. I've been teaching that lesson for over 30 years. Some people take it to heart and they change. But it's absolutely true. This is the truth. God is the ultimate source of truth. Colossians 2 goes on to tell us, I want them to be encouraged, knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So in conclusion today, do you really believe what you believe is really real? Do you really believe it? Do you have that little nagging head, that thing talking to you in here saying, eh, maybe not. Don't let the deceit of lies and doubt creep in to what is the truth of your reality. Can you accept the truths found in the Bible? What is your reality? What is the reality that you are embracing? What is the reality of your life today? Let us pray. Dear God, help us to live a life of faith that is devoted to you. We want to have a heart that perceives you before anything else. You said if we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. Help us to keep focus on you and your will. Align our will with yours and help us to keep your command. Lord, we want to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to you. Help us not to fall into temptation and sin. Forgive us for the times that we've stumbled. Thank you for your forgiveness and your love, your grace, and your unending mercy. We want to change and live by your way, Lord, today. You are merciful, and we know that you will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And I pray that you would provide a way out for us whenever we face those temptations, those voices that try and call us away from you, call us away from your purpose for our lives, and the courage to turn away from those things. Whenever temptation and sin knock, help us to focus instead on your goodness and your love and your truth and your truth so that we can resist them. Lord, we pray for strength whenever we face difficulties that seem to overwhelm us. We lift each worry and burden up to you because we know that you are greater than anything we might face. Remind us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and that we gain strength from doing the things that bring you joy. We want to live our lives out to be a disciple. Teach us how to be a good steward and guard the minutes and hours you've entrusted us with so that we can use our time wisely and not get distracted and not get pulled away from you on meaningless, meaningless things. 
We pray that the desires of our hearts will be aligned with yours so that we can un that we shed our unhealthy habits. Thank you for being our strength, protection, and provider, Lord Jesus. And in your name we pray today. Amen. 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 Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It's a lifelong journey to determine or to seeing the truth that is in these scriptures. It's one that we can't stray away from, even for a day. But the good news, because there's always good news when it comes when it comes to this, is that. Jesus did come. He did die for our sins. And it is for that reason that we take communion or have the Lord's Supper each time that we gather on Sundays. We go to Scripture and we go to what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 11. It says, For I pass on to you what I have received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed. He knew it was coming, but yet on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God. And then he broke it in pieces. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues, in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant an agreement confirmed with my blood do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it when we look at communion tables oftentimes in the wood it'll be inscribed in in remembrance or in remembrance of him it's because we do this each time that we're commanded to do this each time that we come together in remembrance to remember what he did for us it's not just some little thing that we do every time it's not like well uh, let's see here i did this and so i need to do that no this is this is sacred this means that we are participating in that same meal even two thousand years later the body of christ broken for you take and the blood of Christ shed for you. Take it here. Father God, we thank you for what this meal represents. Your sacrifice. The sacrifice you gave of your son on the cross. One that he knew about ahead of time, yet he still chose to do it. Father, let us have that same courage as we go out into the world, a world that is increasingly against you, sharing our hope that we have through you and the love that you shine through us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's time for prayers for the people. <clears throat> This is a time where if you are in need of prayer, um, just let me know and I will I will pray for you. So is anybody in need of prayer this morning? Or? Okay. Everybody's good? <laughs> I'd like to lift up prayers for uh, Dad and for uh, Diane, my mother-in-law. Uh, they're both doing well and they've been having some uh, intestinal problems. I'd like you to pray for us to bring the Holy Spirit to multiply it in our lives and give us a stronger connection with it as always. Okay. Okay. Well, last night we shared a great movie together. It was called Breaking Through. And uh, it was a great testament to the meaning of faith, something we all need to remember and put into practice. 
In Hebrews 13, 5, God says, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? We just got a request online. Oh, okay. Uh, Becky's cousin Steve Myers for his heart. <coughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, but You're I wanted fine. to make sure we... Okay. So I believe that we need to come boldly to God in prayer, like the mother did in the movie last night when she asked the Holy Spirit to enter into her son's body. And um, I believe she had unmovable faith in God. I believe God wants us all to um, have unshakable faith. For God loves us. God is love. And he does not wish that any should perish, but we but have a personal relationship with him so that we know without a doubt God is with us and he will carry us through the trials in this life. He will never leave us or forsake us. So Father God, we just come to you in prayer this morning. I want to lift up Harold this morning and Diane and uh, I just pray that you will comfort them, you will guide them each day, you will heal their bodies by the blood that you, you uh, gave at the cross, Lord Jesus. As it says in the Bible, by your stripes we are healed. Just heal their, their bodies, Lord God, and just be with them each and every day. And Lord Jesus, I pray for Becky, for Steve Myers. He has a heart condition, Lord God, and you are the physician of hearts. You know what, what they are, you made them, Lord Jesus. So comfort him. Heal his body, Lord God. Just let your Holy Spirit wash over him and heal him today. In Jesus' holy name. And I ask that you um, help us all to apply the Holy Spirit into our lives, Lord Jesus. Help us to understand what it is that you have for purpose in our lives. Help us to read your word, Lord Jesus and to come to a personal relationship with you. And just let the Holy Spirit reside in us. Help us to walk by faith, Lord, and not by sight. And Father God, I just want to thank you today for life and breath for each new day, for your amazing grace and mercies you bestow upon us. Without, without all that, who could stand, Lord Jesus? I thank you, God, for mothers, for giving us a heart that cares for others, for giving us patience, strength, beauty, and love. Mothers are the glue that holds the families together. They will stand by their families through all things. We thank you, God, for all mothers in all walks of life. Give them comfort, strength, and wisdom to get through each and every day and every problem that comes their way. Let all mothers be persons of prayer, Lord God, of faith and love for you, Jesus. We ask for all comfort, peace, and healing for all unspoken prayer requests today. God, you know what these needs are for those people. Let your Holy Spirit reign in these people's lives. Give them peace of heart and mind. God, we give you all the praise and glory due your holy name this morning. Thank you for all things, great and small. For you are God, and we are to worship you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. This brings us to the close of our online portion of our service today. Uh, we invite you to come in if you're able and join us so that you can join us in the singing and, and the, uh, in the worship songs that we have today. But let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. And thank you that you hold the keys over death and that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving that way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan for us and that you make a way for us to join you in eternity. We confess today our need for you to refresh us to refresh our minds 
and make us new again in you. We ask that you renew our hearts, our minds, and our lives for the days ahead. We pray for your redemption for us. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us. Help us to keep focused on what is right and pure and give us the power to be obedient to your word. When that little voice of the enemy reminds us where we've been, sending his lies and attacks our way, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our guard, keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles, and covering the pitfalls that would separate us from you. Lord, lead us onto your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, over us, and to be a light to our broken world. May we make a difference in this world for your glory, for your purposes. Set your way before us, and then may all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence, your truth, your healing, your grace, your mercy, and mostly, Lord, it needs your love right now. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift of your Son, Jesus, to you be glory and honor this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name.